Hi folks, welcome back to Physics with Captain Rod. The purpose of this video is to just go through an example of uh, how to use Newton's second law to analyze a system that's made up of several uh, pieces, so to speak. So what we're looking at here, and don't ask me why somebody set this up, but they did. Uh, somebody walked over to this cliff that's oh, maybe about four meters tall total here, and they, they rigged some sort of pulley system. And they've got the following masses here, this red mass and this blue mass uh, connected via this pulley. And this system now we're going to imagine is released from rust. Some data about the system here. Well, the red mass starts about two meters off the ground. And the intention here was to the bottom of the uh, red mass. So I'll go ahead and relabel that. So that's about two meters. Uh, the blue mass is going to be 10 kilograms in this example. The red mass is going to be 30 kilograms in this example. And what we're going to do is try to calculate the time, the delta T it's going to take for this red mass to accelerate down and hit the ground. Assuming that the frictional forces in this problem are small, meaning that we're not going to worry about any friction acting on this mass and or on the pulley for that matter. And we're going to assume that the pulley has a very small mass compared to the red and the blue masses. So, all right. Um, what we're going to want to do here is we're going to want to kind of cut this system apart and draw free bodies of the different parts of the system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this right here and I'm going to make another copy of it. And if you know if you were you know one of my students working on your homework, this is what I would expect you to do is redraw that somewhere. So what I'm doing here is I'm drawing a free body of this part of the system. Now I'm going to go ahead and put force vectors um, on that free body. So what we have here is we have this object. The first force I always recommend people put in is the gravitational force, which is down. Okay, And gravitational forces, I usually label them mg. But keep in mind which mass. This is the red mass. Now surfaces in contact. Whenever I draw a free body, you know, make sure you define your system very clearly. In this example, this is my system. And after you draw the gravitational force, what you're looking for are things coming across that boundary that are in direct physical contact with the object. You'll notice there's a string here that crosses the boundary. So we need to put a force vector in for that string. The force applied by the string is up. That's an example of what we would call a tension. Now you'll notice I drew the mg larger than the tension, and that's because I know that the gravitational force vector has to be larger than the tension. The reason? There's no other forces acting that I'm aware of, and I, can, I know by observation this object's going to accelerate down. If I draw the, you know, the like snapshots in time here, the position of the object's going to change looking something like this. So as this object falls, the velocity vector is going to get larger and larger and larger. So the net force has to be down. Now, next step is to write our Newton's second law equation for the free body. Sum of all forces equals mass times acceleration. Now my standard rule of thumb that I always give for every class, whether it's elementary physics or my dynamics class or whatever, is this. Identify the acceleration direction, call that positive. I've been using that rule for a long, long, long time, and it's, um, it seems to be about the best rule for, cho for choosing directions to write equations in. Because this is accelerating down, I'm going to go ahead and call down positive. So when we add our uh, forces from our free body, we're going to have the mg here, keeping in mind which mass it is, mass of the red object, minus the tension equals ma. And it, and again, we have to indicate which uh, mass we're talking about. We're talking about mass uh, m sub r here. All right. One of the things I find is that probably the most common mistake in this type of free body is people that write the equation with up positive, and there's nothing wrong with that. And they would have t minus mg, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you have ma on the right-hand side, you're actually missing a minus sign, and you won't end up with a consistent set of equations here. If you do up positive, the correct equation is t minus mg equals minus ma. And I find that most students miss that minus sign. So identify the acceleration direction, call that positive. I think that will be the, I think it's the best way to uh, choose a direction for writing Newton's second law equations. Now, as we look the equation over, we don't know the tension, we don't know the acceleration. 
So now what we do is we move over to the next part of the system, which is this. So I'm going to go ahead and clone it. Make myself another copy. And I guess we'll just put that copy right over here. Okay, and now what I'm gonna do is uh, draw my free body. So I know this thing's got a gravitational force on it. I'm gonna put that in there. Oops, that's the first force I always put in a free body. So we've got an MG. Keep in mind that that mass is the blue mass. All right. Now, look at how I'm defining my system. I'm gonna, excuse me one moment. Sorry about that, had to take a quick call. Uh, let's see, where was I? Um, looking at how I'm defining the system here, again, uh, my free body is, is of what's inside this green boundary. I've got the gravitational force, right? That's a field force. Now we're looking for things coming from outside that boundary. The ground is supporting this object. I know there's a tiny little bit of daylight here, but the uh, implication is it's uh, you know sitting on this object or sitting on the ground. So the ground supporting it, that's gonna give what we call a normal force which is going to be up on this object. Oops. The rope here is coming across the boundary, pulling right on this object. So that's going to give us another force, which is a tension. Oops, a little bit large there. And that's pretty well it. We've got the gravitational force and we've got two surface, we've got two contact forces, one for this contact and one for this contact. So that's pretty much a complete free body of the blue mass. Now, if we were dealing with friction, that force would go here and it would be to the left, maybe something like this. But again, part of this problem, I just wanted this to be a relatively simple example, so I assumed friction away. If you're ever dealing with friction, you'll pretty much always need the normal force. So the first step in the free body would be to sum forces in the y direction to get the normal, but I don't need the normal now since there's no friction. So I'm just gonna write one equation here, which is gonna be for the x direction. Sum of all forces, x direction equals ma, calling right positive because, and again, identify the acceleration direction, call that positive. I know from observation of the system, the only way this mass can accelerate is to the right. Now I look at my free body for forces in the x direction, which this is what I'm calling the x direction. There's only one, the tension. And I think I'll save it for another video as to why, but uh, as, you know, as long as this pulley's a fairly low mass and uh, it's not stuck here in some way, it's rolling freely, the pin's working pretty well, then these tensions are basically equal. And I'll save that for another video, but um, I just mentioned the two mechanisms that would change the tension. If this were frozen up some so that this rope had to slide across here, or if this pulley had a very significant mass, that would also change these tensions. But in this example, again, I'm going to assume both of those effects away. So um, this tension and this tension are therefore the same. So let's see, we have T equals MA. Keep in mind that the mass for this guy is the blue one. And now what we have is a pair of equations here uh, with unknowns tension, acceleration, tension, acceleration. Next step is an algebra step. We need to solve um, this system of equations. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this and sub it right there and rewrite our equations. So we're gonna have the red mass times G minus T, which we know to be equal to this, M sub B times A equals m sub r times a. Now, to answer the question, what I want is I'm gonna need the acceleration of this object. So that's in this equation here. So this term needs to be added to the right. So m sub r times g is gonna equal m sub r times a plus m sub b times a. Now, what I want is the acceleration, and I could put numbers in at this point, but I'm not going to, because I want to take a, a moment and talk about you know, how to check your work. If I factor the acceleration out of this, I'm gonna cheat a little bit here. I'll just 
let's do this. There's my new line. So I can solve that for the acceleration. And what we're going to have is the red mass divided by, this is the sum of the two, mass of the red plus mass of the blue, uh, and then times g. Now remember that g has units of uh, meter per second squared. I get asked all the time, how do we know we're, when we're right? Well, what you have to do is you have to check your work against the extremes in the problem. That's one way. First of all, you'll notice, uh, even before I do that, this thing is dimensionally fine because mass over mass, this quantity is unitless, and g has units of acceleration, meter per second squared. So our dimension is correct. That's a good that's a good sign. It doesn't guarantee it's right, but if it if this thing dimensionally did not work out the meter per second squared, that does guarantee it's wrong. Second, I like to check my values against, or check my answer against extreme values. Imagine that the red mass were like a million kilograms and the blue mass were like one kilogram. For all practical purposes, this would be a free fall problem and the acceleration down should be g. And when we look at this ratio, if the red mass is a lot bigger than the blue mass, then this bottom is approximately equal to just the red mass. And then these would just cancel, leaving acceleration of g. Um, another thing to notice is this. If the blue mass were like a million kilograms and the red mass were like one kilogram, this thing would basically just sit here. I mean, unless you had an hour to wait. And you'll notice in this equation here, if the blue mass is much larger than the red, then this ratio is approximately zero. So anyway, checking our uh, results against extreme values is a good uh, thing to do. I'm pretty confident these results are right. So now we're going to get a number out of this. So, uh, and take note that the masses are, uh, the units will just cancel anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and just leave them off. So this is going to be 30 over m sub r plus m sub b. And to save myself some writing, I'm just going to add them and then write it. That's going to be 40 and then times g, 9.8 meter over second squared. So what we're going to have here is that the system is going to accelerate at about, give me a moment here, looks like three quarter g. So I get about 7.35 meter per second squared out of that. So there's the acceleration of the system. This red mass is going to accelerate down at about 7.35 meter per second squared. Blue mass will accelerate right at about 3.5 meter per second squared. The next part of this problem is to study the motion. I'm going to study the motion of the red mass as it accelerates down. So I need to get rid of, or at least move some of this to make myself some room. You know, I am just going to get rid of it. So anybody watching the video, you can go back to a point if you need to, oops, and take a look at the work. And what I'm going to do now is focus on the motion part of the problem. All right, so now, how do we study motion? Well, in my classes, what I usually have people do is start by drawing a velocity graph, a graph that describes the velocity of your particle against time. Now, I did not maybe put this in my assumptions, but what I had intended was starting from rest. So if I were to graph velocity against time at t equals zero, if this thing starts from rest, we would be here. Now, whether our velocities are going to be positive or negative, that's, that's completely viewpoint. It's up to uh, the observer here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure x from here, and I'm going to go ahead and call down positive. You can use any variable you want. It doesn't matter if you call it x or y. Now that I've defined down as positive, as this thing moves and its velocity increases, it increases, it increases, and it's pointed down, these are positive velocities. So this graph is going to look something like this. Now, it's linear uh, for a very specific reason. You'll notice this acceleration doesn't have any function attached to it. It doesn't seem to depend on position or time. So if we have a constant acceleration, that would give us a linear velocity graph. Now, how complex the math needs to be, well, 
Um, I mean, that depends on the problem. This is a relatively simple problem. There's really no need in this problem to worry about deriving functions or uh, equations here. I think we can probably get this done just by saying, all right, when it hits the ground, that's going to be some time t, which we don't know. We are also not going to know, at least not directly here, the final velocity. So I'm just going to give that a name and call it v final. Now, this graph here has two important properties that we use, slope and area. The slope is the acceleration, which in this case is 7.35 meter per second squared. And remember, slope is rise over run, so I can write that v final over t. Now as I look at this, I say to myself, huh, I don't know the v final or the t. That's okay, I'm just going to move, move along now and try to write another equation. The displacement um, can be found from a velocity graph by this bound area here. So again, if you're not familiar with that, if you look through some of my previous videos here, you'll find one that says how to find the displacement of a particle from a velocity graph. This bound area here is going to give the displacement. So I'm going to write delta x equals, and because this is a triangle, I can write this 1 half t times v final. Now, in this example, the delta x is positive 2 meters. So I'm going to go ahead and write uh, 2 meters equals 1 half t times v final. And what we have here now is two equations, two unknowns. Uh, how we solve it is kind of uh, going to be up to us. I think what I'll do here is if we solve this one for v final, and I'm going to put NCU, which notes for which stands for note consistent units. If I multiply by t, what we're going to have is 7.35t. Now anywhere I see a v final, I can put 7.35t. I'm going to rewrite this equation here, and I'm going to go ahead and leave the units off because they're consistent. We're going to have 2 equals 1 half t times v final, which is 7.35t. Next step here, I can multiply by 2. This is now going to read 4 equals 7.5t squared. I'm sorry, 7.35. t squared. Next line, uh, we would divide both sides by 7.35 and we're going to have 0.544 equals t squared. The units here would be second squared and then we would square root that. And I get 0.74, give or take. So I get a time frame of about 0.7, oops, 0.74 seconds. So, uh, again, the point of this problem here was to um, learn how to cut a system apart and draw free bodies of different parts of a system, and then how to take our results and kind of combine it with a study of motion by drawing a velocity graph for the system and using slope and area to uh, solve the rest of the problem. Hope this video helps demonstrate these concepts. Have a great day.